Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. It's Monday evening again and time for the weekly visit with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting us, so let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Ah, there you are, Mr. Beryl. Drop your usual chair and settle down. Hmm. That's it. Thanks, Dr. Watson. And now, how about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure? I think it'll intrigue you, Mr. Beryl, for in it, Sherlock Holmes once again crossed swords with his most famous opponent, the man whom Holmes referred to as a Napoleon of crime. The redoubtable Professor Moriarty. And who came off best on this occasion? Supposing you let me tell the story from the beginning, my boy, and then you can decide the matter for yourself. <laughs> All right, Dr. Watson. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the case of the Harley Street murders? Well, Mr. Bell, that story began on a December evening at the turn of the century. I had occasion to visit a certain doctor that night, I remember. And after an early dinner in Baker Street, I was able to persuade Sherlock Holmes to walk with me on my mission to nearby Harley Street. Holmes was never very keen on indulging in exercise for its own sake, and as we tramped through the frosty streets, his noticeably bad humour made me realise that I might have been wiser to have left him at home amid the material comforts of our flat. Finally, he turned to there. We should have taken a handsome cab, Watson. Why, Holmes? It's not more than a ten-minute walk. A cab would have taken three. The remaining seven minutes might have been more comfortably employed at home. Rubbish. A brisk walk after dinner is good for one. It uh, aids the digestion. My but... digestion is as uncomplicated as that of a horse. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to understand the hearty Englishman who believes that a resounding plunge into ice-cold water or running round Hyde Park on a rainy day in an attenuated pair of shorts are the obvious ways of inducing glowing health and a happy digestion. Personally, I think such asinine behavior is merely conducive to double pneumonia. Then why did you come with a... Uh... Because you said you were going to call on Dr. Ingleby. You're familiar with the name? Oh, yes. Uh, then perhaps you'd be rather startled to learn that Dr. Ingleby is a woman. Uh, no, Watson. I was well aware of the fact. Oh, well, how do you know? Because I read an article of hers in the current medical bulletin. It was signed Sarah Ingleby, M.D. I've yet to meet a man with the Christian name of Sarah, therefore oh. I deduce she's a woman. Amazing deduction. Quite amazing. But you haven't told me why you're calling on her tonight, Watson. Well, I knew her slightly at the University of London. Nice woman, though I never can understand why a woman wants to be a doctor. Anyway, I'm on the committee for collecting a present for old Professor Taylor on his retirement. She was one of his pet students, and I'm hoping for a substantial contribution from the lady. Hello. That was the police whistle. Yes, and look at the crowd up there ahead. Come on, Watson. Come on, come on, then. Uh, keep back there. Oh, hello. Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson. Evening, gentlemen. Good evening. What's wrong, Lestrade? Murder. That's what's wrong, Mr. Holmes. Murder? Yeah, come and look what we found at the foot of the basement steps half an hour ago. Get out of the way and keep them there, constable. <laughs> There you are, gentlemen. Take a look at that. Great Scott. A well-dressed man and lying in a pool of blood. Yeah, he was well-dressed all right when we found him. Had a nice shiny knife sticking through the third button of his waistcoat. And has he been identified? Yes, Mr. Holmes. He's Dr. Marsden. His consulting room is on the second floor. Must have been stabbed as he came out of the front door and then chucked down this basement. Hmm. Was he robbed? No, sir. His wallet had three five-pound notes in it. They, they weren't touched. Nor was the uh, gold watch and chain he was wearing. Have you been able to unearth any clue as to motive, Inspector? Not a blooming one, Doctor. Uh, just been talking with his nurse. From what she says, he didn't have an enemy in the world. No robbery, no apparent motive, no clues, eh, Lestrade? Provoking problem. Well, come on, Watson. We must be on our way. Huh? You, you mean that you're going to leave? Oh, I thought this would be a case after your own heart, Mr. Holmes. I was hoping you'd give me a bit of help. No, Lestrade, it's no concern of mine. Let Scotland Yard do its own work for once. Come on, Watson. The doctor we're interested in is alive and a woman. Oh, well, I don't think Dr. Ingleby will see you, gentlemen. She didn't tell me she's expecting anyone. Nevertheless, my good woman, I think if you mention my name, she'll gladly give us a few moments. Well, you can 
come in. Oh, very kind of him. What were the names again, please? Uh, Dr. Watson and uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Who is it, Agnes? Mm, it's a Dr. Watson and a Mr. Holmes, ma'am. I told him that you weren't in the habit yes, of residing. all right, Agnes. Mm. You can leave us. Yes, ma'am. Oh, but... <laughs> Perhaps you, you remember me, Dr. Ingleby. Yes, indeed, Dr. Watson. At the university, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, do come into the sitting room, won't you? And you, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, isn't it? Yes, Dr. Ingleby. I'm flattered to meet so famous a man. Thank you, madam. And uh, may I say how glad I am to have this opportunity of making your acquaintance? Thank you. I read your article in the current medical journal with intense interest. Your invention of a new type of surgical knife that applies a local anesthetic at the same time as it cuts should prove extremely valuable. I wish the Royal College of Surgeons would agree with you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, you've encountered opposition from them, Dr. Ingleby? Great opposition. Yeah. <laughs> it seems odd that every stride in medical science should be countered by opposition of the very people it would assist. But I'm sure you haven't come here to discuss my new discovery, gentlemen. Well, as a matter of fact, Dr. Ingleby, I'm on the committee that's raising a fund for a parting present for old Professor Taylor. Oh. You were a student of his, and I thought Oh, yes, that, of course. Uh, I'd like to contribute, Dr. Watson. Uh, how would uh, ten guineas be? Oh, that's, that's very generous of you. Oh, no. It's Dr. McKinney to see you, Mum. Oh, David, how nice to see you. Hello, Sarah, my dear. Oh, let me introduce you. Uh, Dr. David McKenna, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and do? Dr. Watson. How are you, Doctor? Did you hear about the trouble down the street, Sarah? You mean about Dr. Marsden? Aye. Yes. But please don't talk about it, David. It's too awful. Oh, Dr. Watson, I'll just write that check oh, for you now. Thank you so much. And Dr. McKenna, it's fortunate that I met you here. I was planning to call on you in the next few days. Surely not in my professional capacity. Your friend here is an excellent oh, doctor. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. No, Dr. McKenna, I was curious to talk to you since I heard that you were the executor of the Galbraith Estates. Uh, have you been having any difficulties, may I ask? Funny you should ask me that. For the past week, I've been absolutely pestered by some confounded mathematics professor who wants to buy the Cornish property. But I'm not going to settle. I'm keeping the place in trust for the ear. A professor of mathematics, huh? Very interesting. Tell me, Dr. McKenna, have any attempts been made on your life recently? Well, you're positively psychic, Holmes. On Wednesday, I was nearly run down by a horse van in Welbeck Street. I swear it wasn't an accident. Mm -hmm. On Thursday night, I was assaulted by a footpad as I was approaching my house. Sweet. Fortunately, I'm something of a boxer and I was able to drive him away. I see. And only this morning, as I was walking down Deer Street, a brick came down from the roof of one of the houses and shattered to pieces at my feet. Good Lord, you've, uh, you've informed the police, of course. No, I haven't. I can take care of myself. Then please let me warn you, Dr. McKenna. Watch yourself carefully. Until the estate is settled, receive no private visits from strangers. Mr. Holmes, may I ask what knowledge you have of my affairs? I'm afraid that at the moment, sir, I'm not in a position to be any more explicit. However, I repeat my warning with the utmost gravity. Well, my soul, you're being very mysterious. Here's your check, Dr. Watson. Oh, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Ingleby. That's, that's very, very kind of you. Watson, I think we should be on our way. Good evening, Dr. Ingleby. Good, Good night, Mr. McKenna. Holmes. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Watson. Holmes. I've never seen you so, so confoundedly mysterious. Shh, listen. Curious chap, that Sherlock Holmes. Fancy his warning me like that. Oh, it's his profession. He sends murder everywhere. Except under his own nose. Extraordinary remark. Get your coat, Watson. Let's get back to Baker Street. This is quite a three-pipe problem. You know, Holmes, I'm suspicious of that woman. She behaved very queerly when the murder was mentioned, and that remark of hers a moment ago was very odd, too. You are leaping to conclusions, my dear Watson. At the moment, I'm much more interested in the fact that the mysterious mathematics professor in whose path Dr. McKenna stands is undoubtedly our old friend, the professor. Hi, Archie. Right. You think that he was connected with that murder tonight, too? Indirectly, yes, Watson. And I fear that before we unravel this complicated skein of circumstances, several more members of the medical profession are doomed to die. <laughs> Get your papa, get your late night final, new murders in Arley Street. Extra late night final, another doctor murdered in Arley.
Harley Street. Evening Piper Extra. Fifth Doctor Slane in Harley Street. Extra, extra. Get your Piper. You know, Holmes, it's extraordinary the way these medical murders are baffling the police. I expect Lestrade will be around soon to try and interest you in them again. But I am interested, Watson. Oh? The crimes are wanton, apparently motiveless, yet dexterously executed. A fascinating field for speculation. But I'm even more interested in the probable next move of Professor Moriarty. I know that Dr. McKenna stands in his way. Moriarty, so I've discovered, covets the Cornish portions of the Galbraith Estates. Oh, does he? He has certain plans connected with the caves there. Oh, perhaps he does, but I must say that my interests lie here in London. Five murders in a week. All of the victims are doctors. <laughs> Quite frankly, I'm beginning to feel a little uneasy myself. Quite understandable. Uh, by the way, didn't the new copy of the bulletin of the Royal College of Surgeons arrive in the post? Yes, yes, I, I just skimmed through it here. Wait a minute. Ah, there you are. Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. Just as I thought. Listen to this, Watson. Hand me the new copy of the Bulletin of the Royal College of Surgeons, Carter, will you? Here it is, Professor Moriarty. Ah, uh -huh. Just as I thought, Carter. I had already concluded that these much-publicized medical murders were in all likelihood committed by a half-madman who felt himself persecuted by doctors. Well... But why these particular doctors, I ask myself? Here is the answer, Carter. The names of all the murdered men are on one committee. Illuminating, Carter, isn't it? Yes, it is, Professor. <laughs> Very illuminating. Illuminating, Watson, isn't it? Yes, it is, Holmes. <laughs> all the murdered men were on one committee... A committee that emphatically rejected as impractical Dr. Sarah Ingleby's invention. Then it begins to look as if I was right in suspecting her. Yes, old chap, it seems that your guesswork hit upon the truth. But now we have to work fast. Our first step should be obvious. To call on Dr. McKenna, I suppose. He's the only member of that medical committee who is still living. He is undoubtedly in grave danger. But I've warned him to be on his guard. No, Watson, our next step is to strike at the source of this deviltry. We'll call on Dr. Sarah Ingleby at once. But you can't see the doctor, Mr. Holmes. She went out not ten minutes ago. Did she leave alone? No, sir. A man came to see her. He stayed talking for half an hour and, and they went out together. Mm. Can you describe the man? Let me see. He was very tall and thin with a, an eye forehead and deep-set eyes. Professor Moriarty. Precisely. Thank you. You've been extremely helpful. <laughs> Glad to be in a service, I'm sure, gentlemen. What do you suppose Moriarty has to do with Dr. Ingleby, Holmes? I shall suppose nothing, Watson. One of the reasons that Moriarty and I have so often ended in a stalemate is that each of us is eminently capable of reconstructing the processes of the other's mind. Let me think. If I were Moriarty... Great heavens, Watson. We must act at once. Moriarty has just secured the most dangerous weapon of his entire career. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes as he endeavors to solve the strange case of the Harley Street murders. Now, Dr. Watson, you certainly had me on the edge of my chair there. What happened next? Well, Mr. Bell, supposing I pick up my story at the exact place I left off, as Sherlock Holmes turned to me and said... Yes, Watson. Moriarty has just secured the most dangerous weapon of his entire career. Come along. A weapon? Oh, I don't understand, Holmes. I warned Dr. McKenna to admit no stranger to his house because I know that Moriarty aims at his death. But the person he is sure to admit is the woman to whom he's so obviously devoted. Dr. Sarah Ingleby. Yes, Watson. The pattern begins to become frighteningly clear. And if Moriarty is half the brain I know him to be, I can just imagine how devilishly persuasive he's being at this very moment. And so you see, my dear Dr. Ingleby... 
that your real enemy is not that committee. But they banned the use of my new discovery, Professor Moriarty. They ruined my life's work. And so I made them pay with their own lives. Oh, quite so, my dear. And I sympathize and admire the way you uh, erased them. Masterly, quite masterly. But they were mere tools. It is Dr. McKenna who was behind that committee. I can't believe that David would have done that. He told me he loved me. All the more reason why he was jealous of your scientific attainments. He resents women in his field. He told me that himself. <laughs> he planned to destroy you as a doctor. He told you that? That and much more that I couldn't repeat to you, my dear. Then he must die, too. Of course. He must. I can't thank you enough for opening my eyes, Professor. Now I know what I must do. But you must have steady nerves for so great a task, my dear. Uh, yes. I yes. have here some capsules of my own manufacture. I think if you'll take one, you'll find it extremely efficacious. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> and now I shall call on David McKenna... Dr. McKenna, you must believe me when I tell you that you're in desperate danger. But, Mr. Yes, Holmes... yes, Doctor. That's why we came directly to you after calling on on, uh, on the person that we believe to be the murderer. And who is that person, may I ask? I'm afraid I can't answer that question for you at the moment, Dr. McKenna. Uh, not until my strong suspicion is confirmed. I can tell you, however, that a dangerous criminal by the name of Moriarty has a new and perfect weapon in his power. Weapon? Yes, a lunatic whose murderous hate could be turned against you. Well, it all sounds very melodramatic. Well, perhaps it does, but you'll be wise to listen to my friend. I wouldn't be at all surprised if the murderer is approaching your house now. What? And it's someone that you would admit unquestioningly, and who would strike you down on the spot. I must implore you to retire, Dr. McCarr. But what are you and Dr. Watson going to do? Bait a trap here in your sitting room. Oh, very well. I suppose I'd be stupid to ignore your warning. But I wish you could be a little more specific. I'll be in my library on the first floor. Well, what bait are you going to use for the trap, Holmes? You, old chap. Who? Huh? Me? Yes. You're not unlike Dr. McKenna in build. And I'm sure you will have little difficulty in imitating his Scotch accent. If, uh, you sit at the writing desk here... <laughs> With your back to the door, so I'll turn down the gaslight. When Dr. McKenna's visitor arrives, I shall be in hiding behind this curtain. And in the meanwhile? We must wait, Watson. And I don't think we shall have to wait very long. There's the bell now. Yes. The maid's going to answer the door. I'll slip behind these curtains. Keep up the deception as long as you can, Watson. We want to catch her red-handed. But be careful. Undoubtedly, she's carrying a knife. You always give me the best job, don't you? They're coming. All right, all right. Come on. Who's that? David. Is that you? Hey, sir, that's me. Excuse me, I'll, I'll just finish this letter. You'll and... never finish it, David. No, you don't. Ah, you devil! It's all right, Watson. I've got her out. Oh, I can't hear it. Oh, 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 what kind of a trap is this? One that has caught you very neatly, Dr. Ingleby. I'll take that knife, thank you. Do you oh. admit that you came here to kill Dr. McKenna? Oh, of course I do. Why did you fool stop me? I'd have killed him just like I killed the others. <laughs> if you could have seen their stupid faces. A knife so clean and easy. <laughs> it really was surprisingly easy. I gloried in killing them. <laughs> but this last I attempt... In it. This last attempt wasn't your own idea, was it? No, it wasn't. I must say, I didn't believe that David was against me, too. Then what made you change your mind? Change... Change... Mine? Yes. Who suggested the idea to you? Yes. Professor... Uh, oh, Professor... Uh. Confound 
minute she's fainted just as she was going to give us vital information. That's the trouble with women. They get so highly emotional. That's not the trouble with this woman, Watson. She didn't faint. She's dead. Hello, Miss Holmes. Dr. Watson. Good morning, Miss Holmes. Good morning, Inspector. Yeah. I thought you'd be coming around to see us at Scotland Yard before you were through. Going to crow over us, I suppose. No, Lestrade, I have no intention of crowing. I blame myself for not having solved the case sooner. Well, the newspapers don't blame you, Holmes. I've never seen such eulogies. Yes, Doctor. And once again, the Yard gets all the brickbats. We should come in on the case with, uh, with me when I first asked you, Mr. Holmes. Well, no good crying over spilt milk. Case is closed. Yeah, with you and Dr. Watson both hearing her confession, all that's left to do is to have a statement drawn up and have you gentlemen sign it. Eh, too bad she went and committed suicide, though. I still don't understand how she did it while we were holding her arms. I quite agree, Watson. That's why I came to Scotland Yard. Oh, uh, you want to see the post-mortem report, don't you, Mr. Holmes? It's here on the desk somewhere. She used cyanide, you know. Well, that's the fastest-acting poison known. True, Watson. But I'll swear she didn't swallow anything while we were holding her. That's what puzzles me. Ah, here's the doctor's report, Mr. Holmes. Enlightening. Most enlightening. Well, why'd you say that, Mr. Holmes? Dr. Ingleby did not commit suicide. She, too, was murdered. Murdered? She died in full view of us. How could she have been murdered? Look at the post-mortem report. Something else significant besides poison was found. Oh, look. It says here that the heavy traces of gelatine were found in the stomach. Precisely. There's the answer. Gelatine? <laughs> but what does that prove? Merely that the woman had eaten some jellied pudding. Yes, exactly. But remember, gelatin is also used to coat capsules. But that still doesn't explain how she swallowed it before our very eyes. That's just the point, Watson. She didn't. Remember that they were extensive traces of gelatin. A capsule of extremely thick gelatin would not dissolve for some time. Obviously, Moriarty gave her the capsule. She swallowed it. And before the gelatin had melted and released the deadly poison, she had ample time to commit another murder had we not prevented her. As ingenious and diabolical a murder as ever I encountered. Christ Scott, so Moriarty used her as a tool to kill Dr. McKenna, knowing that she herself would drop dead before she could incriminate him. Exactly, Watson. Well, blow me down, Mr. Holmes. <laughs> Professor Moriarty's outwitted you again. I wouldn't quite say that, Lestrade. I'd call it another stalemate. You know, Mr. Holmes, I begin to think you're never going to catch him for us. I refuse to show your pessimism, Inspector. This has been another stalemate, yes. But you mark my words. Moriarty's reign will not last forever. There will come a day, Lestrade. Yes, there will come a day... Now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. Next week, I think I'll tell you how Holmes, by a brilliant deductive reasoning, proved that what appeared to be a simple case of accidental drowning was in reality a diabolical murder. I call it the adventure of the submerged baronet. <laughs> Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Final Problem. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of Universal International Pictures. Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. The Sherlock Holmes series is produced by Tom McKnight, with original music composed and conducted by Alex Steinert. This is Joseph Bell, and inviting you to be with us next week at the same time, when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the submerged... Baronet. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.